Library in the nation. I'm Holly Carroll, Deputy Director, and so we're pleased to see so many of you here tonight as we pay tribute to a native Clevelander and award winning author, Carla Miller. <laughs> it may be tried time now, but for the next few hours, it's Carla Ellison time. And those of you who are Cleveland Indian fans uh, know that this is the, the, the tagline that you're seeing all over town. It's, it's tribe time now as we're about ready to clinch the Eastern Division championship. Well, I've had a pleasure just a few minutes ago of meeting Harlan for the first time and his charming wife, Susan. And I thank you both for coming to Cleveland to make this Midwestern debut of the documentary Dreams with Sharp Teeth, very special indeed. Thanks also to Eric Nelson, who, uh, the director and producer of the film, for approaching the library and, and Ron Antonucci to um, pose the question if we could be a possible site for this debut. And I understand he's in Vancouver tonight and couldn't join us. Well, I am, I am getting to that. <laughs> the catalyst for tonight's program is Ron Antonucci, manager of CTO. <laughs> he convinced me about six months ago that we should take advantage of this opportunity to show the film. And then, to seal the deal, he convinced Mr. Ellison to be here as well. Furthermore, he planned the, all the other aspects of this evening with a special guest and the rest of the tribute that will be presented shortly. Ron, thank you for your tenaciousness and attention to detail. You are a wonderful advocate for the arts and literature in Greater Cleveland. Let's give him a round of applause. There will be time after Mr. Ellison's appearance after the film to get your books autographed, if you haven't already. Um, right, right. Susan Ellison has out of print copies of um, Harlan's books for sale, and the Friends of the Cleveland Public Library are outside in the foyer selling books that are in print. Um, and so we thank them, too, for um, getting all the, the titles in print here for you to purchase. Enjoy the next few hours, and now please welcome Ron Antonucci to the podium. Uh, well, thank you, Holly. <clears throat> and uh, it's been an interesting six months and certainly an interesting uh, 24 hours. And uh, I appreciate your comments and uh, do sincerely hope I'm still employed here next week. <laughs> <laughs> 
after what you're about to go through tonight. Uh, <laughs> and, and my cardiologist just loves this whole thing. Uh, so how often do you get to uh, see a documentary film about a living legend with the living legend actually in the room with you? How is that? I want you to just, just for a moment stand up and take a bow and say hello to the audience. And I'll introduce you, you get to talk later on, but right now just turn around and say hello to the audience and let them applaud you. <laughs> well, today we pay tribute to a man who is both an icon and an iconoclast. Harlan Ellison's storied career is the stuff of legend. He has enriched our culture while simultaneously tearing it apart. And he has somehow managed to go from being labeled the bad boy of science fiction to being its grand master. Harlan Ellison has been, quite simply, one of the best writers in the world for the past 60 years. Cleveland, Ohio is proud of him, and Cleveland Public Library is honored to host this event. Now, in preparing for tonight's uh, festivities, I asked Susan Ellison, and that's Susan Ellison over the table over there, uh, a long-suffering, very patient Susan Ellison, <laughs> uh, I asked Susan if she could solicit a few letters of uh, tribute from a few of Harlan's friends and colleagues, uh, and I had planned to read those here tonight very dramatically and all that, uh, but there are almost 50 of them, uh, and the list of names will be familiar to most of you. Among them, Stan Lee. Janet Asimov, Michael Moorcock, Joyce Carol Oates, Dan Simmons, Stuart Kaminsky, Daniel Pinkwater, Mark Wolfman, Leo and Diane Dillon, Vonda McIntyre, Leonard Malton, Robert Culp, L.Q. Jones, Richard Matheson, and the list goes on. What do you mean L.Q. Jones? L.Q. Jones? Yeah. Yeah. L.Q. Jones. That's what I thought. L.Q. <laughs> and we have gathered those tributes uh, into a gift book for Harlan. Uh, this was designed and put together by Monica Morabito, our ace in the graphics department downstairs. She's an absolutely wonderful uh, graphic artist. And Harlan, this is a, a, your gift. I don't want you to have it because they'll play with it during the movie and you'll, you'll mess it up. <laughs> the, cover, the cover has an image of the Phantom saying, Thank you, Harlan, Cleveland, Ohio, September 21, 2007. And uh, this is the image is courtesy of Moonstone Books. I have to say, next to give him the book. <laughs> And most of those tributes have been reprinted on placards out in the lobby. I saw a number of you taking a look at those and reading them, and uh, you know, please enjoy them uh, throughout the evening. Uh, now, I've also enlisted a few of Harlan's friends and colleagues to appear in person uh, to say a few words about the man. And uh, we had a lot to do tonight. The movie was like 96 minutes long, so we're going to be quick about it. But uh, I do want to uh, have a few of his friends, people who worked with him and know him very well, uh, come up and say a few things. Would you please welcome Cleveland's leading man of mystery, Les Roberts. Yes! Thank you very much. Isn't this a great year for Cleveland? I mean, we have the Cavs in the playoffs. We have the Indians just teetering on winning it all. And now we've got Harlem. <laughs> I first met Harlan uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, there was a dinner in Los Angeles at the Mystery Writers of America. I was sitting at this table, and he walked in and sat right down next to me. And I have to tell you that that's the first time I was ever aware of the expression shock and awe. <laughs> uh, he is uh, a very powerful personality, a delightful personality. And we were talking earlier, I've known Harlan for 20 years, and he's never yelled at me once. 
uh, but that's because I moved out of town. During <laughs> uh, he's given me an awful lot. Uh, I wrote my first book about Cleveland, Pepper Pike, uh, and it came out in 1988, uh, shortly after I'd met him. Uh, I was still living in Los Angeles. He called me on the phone. I hardly knew the guy. And he said, uh, Roberts. I said, yes. He said, Ellison. And I said, Harlan Ellison. He said, don't you know that I used to live in Cleveland, for Christ's sake? And I said, no, I didn't know that. He said, get up here. I want to talk to you about it. I went up to his house. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been to his house. I'm not sure. I think the building that we are now in has a few more books than Harlan's house, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's an amazing house, and it was an amazing guy, and he told me all about Cleveland, and gave me some books to read, and inspired me to write another uh, book about Cleveland. Um, Harlan is very, very instrumental in my sticking with Cleveland as a uh, subject for my series. And he's also very, very uh, important to me because he happens to be, in my opinion, and many other people too, the greatest living American writer. And very seriously, I am delighted that he's here tonight and thrilled to see him. And I would stand up here and talk about him for another three or four hours, but Ron told me I have three minutes and I think they're up. So uh, stick around, enjoy the movie, enjoy this astonishing man. I don't know what the hell he's going to say, and frankly, neither does he. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I guarantee you, it's going to be sensational. So thank you very much. Thank you, Les. Now would you please welcome comic book writer and editor, Tony Isabella. He's funny. He's smarter than I am. <laughs> there are, there's probably nothing I can tell you about Harlan Ellison that you don't already know or that he couldn't tell it better. Uh, he has been a friend of mine for, I think, about 30 years. Uh, he was my editor on one occasion. It was one of the best experiences I ever had writing uh, comics. Uh, he's had my back a couple of times when I really needed him to have my back. Uh, when I'm 100 years old, and Harlan is slightly older than that, if I get into a barroom brawl, there's nobody I'd rather have next to me than Harlan. Uh, he is a tenacious friend. He is a loyal friend. Uh, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, today I'm going to talk about how Harlan told me, taught me, that the work I wanted to do as a writer had value and honor. Uh, it was in 1972 that I moved from Cleveland, leaving a job at the Plain Dealer, uh, to go work for Marvel Comics. Um, I was living in a basement apartment in Brooklyn, uh, run by, you know, owned by people who kept the thermostat low so that in the basement it would be approximately 45, 50 degrees. I was away from home for the first time, uh, lonely, and every night I'd come home from Marvel, and what I would read was one of the two books that I had brought from Cleveland. Uh, Dangerous Visions, uh, his anthology of, of just wonderful stories. But I'm not going to talk about those wonderful stories because that's not the main effect this book had on me. Every night I'd come home, you know, freeze to death, and read these introductions by Harlan. And I began to realize that, that no, writing was more than just a job for me. It was my calling. It was what I wanted to do. There was value to it, and there was honor to it. There was even nobility to it. And these are the lessons that I learned from Harlan. Uh, over the years, the man has just continued 
to teach me, to teach all of us. Uh, he is one of the world's greatest writers ever. Uh, he is a dynamo for social justice. Uh, he is who I want to be when I grow up. Uh, so, thank you for this opportunity, Ron, to say a few words about my friend Harlan. Thank you, Harlan, for all those years and, and many more years to come. Thank you, Susan, for keeping our boys together. And enjoy the movie. Uh, I don't toss around the term living legend loosely. I've used it for exactly three people in my life. Stan Lee, who was my first boss, Julie Schwartz, who was a great friend of Harlan's and a friend of mine, and Harlan himself. Thank you. Enjoy the program. Thank you, Paisan. And now, would you please welcome Harlan's niece and a Cleveland resident, Lisa Rubin. Harlan is my uncle. We have something in common. Sarita Rosenthal Ellison. Harlan's mother, my grandmother. She rubbed off on us. Sarita had a need for three things. Danger, adventure, and spontaneity. Danger, just a little taste, gave her a fit. You know those coin basket toll booths in Miami Beach? Sarita would purposely miss the target, the light and siren. <laughs> and she would laugh hysterically. Adventure. Sarita loved travel and new experiences. One time when I was 13, she put me in front of a roulette table in Paradise Island with a big stack of chips. Don't lose them too fast, she said to me, and then disappeared into the casino. Spontaneity. <laughs> destination, grocery store. We would get in the car and Sarita with great joy would take a random turn and say, let's get lost. And we would. Oh, and one other thing Sarita loved was gambling. Oi, she gambled. The card room at Morton Towers in Miami Beach where she lived was filled with matches. And Sarita would clean up every night. She had skills. But nightly conversations around those gin rum tables would always come around to her son. My son Harlan, you know, he's a mocker. Oh, he's a big famous writer. Sarita would fell over his new book, and when her signed autograph copy arrived, two mother from your loving son, she would be bursting. Sarita always believed in Harlan and me. She never judged, she never criticized, and she was always so proud. Harlan, we, and I mean your family, and I include all the Putzes, the Schlemiels, and the Yenses are so terribly proud of all of your accomplishments. Not only are you a world-renowned author, but a true match. <laughs> I love you, Aunt. And for Sarita, all right, already, quit with the nudging. I continue to fulfill your last words and wishes to me. Please, please stay in touch with our one. <laughs> together, but uh, there's one person, uh, if it wasn't for him, and who's, who's urging me along and uh, giving me some ideas and helping me every step of the way, uh, putting it together. We wouldn't be here tonight. Would you please welcome the Plain Dealer TV critic and the writer, Mark DeWinziak. I don't want to follow that. That was too good. Um, your heroes ought to teach you something. Um, Harlan is my one of my heroes because he taught me, in his words, that writing is not a job, 
in his words, it's a goddamn holy chore. <laughs> that is. Um, this film, you have to listen to very, very carefully at the beginning because it begins softly. And you have to listen to the words. And it begins with Robin Williams asking Harlan, uh, true or false, on some of the more interesting stories of his life. Um, in that spirit, true or false, the first time I was talking to Harlan Ellison, uh, I called him a science fiction writer. False. <laughs> Thought you'd walk into that one, did you? 1985, uh, Harlan was the. What would you what would what way would you define your role in the Twilight Zone? I was the creative consultant. He was their uh, their conscience, I would say, um, and they. Uh, Said you can interview anybody on the show. I said I want Harlan Ellison. I've never spoken to him, and this will be this will be wonderful. So the phone rings, and there's a voice on the other end. It says, "With the act, Allison. One ground rule." I said, "I can't call you a science fiction writer." He said, "God bless you." <laughs> I said, "You don't believe in God." He said, "That's how much I mean it." <laughs> And we've been doing that ever since. Um, but it is uh, instructive because I do not value Harlan Ellison because he is a great science fiction writer, although he has written great science fiction. I do not value him because he is a great TV critic, although he has written landmark TV criticism, and every TV critic is in his debt to that. I did not value him because he is a great essayist, although he has written essays that has taken the top of my head off. I have valued him because the same reason that I value Mark Twain and John Steinbeck because he is a great American writer. And that he taught me that writing is a goddamn holy chore. And you better take that seriously. You're going to enjoy getting to know Harlan Ellison in this film. I collect documentaries about writers. I've got shells and shelves of them and there's about two of them that I think at the end of them you actually get to know the writer. Oh, you get to know dates, you get to know when they did something and when they wrote something and when they were born. But at the end of the film, you know, don't know them any better than you did when the film starts. When this film ends, for those of you who know Harlan, it will be a splendid reintroduction. And for those of you who don't know them, you will get to know him and then afterwards, you can compare it to the genuine article himself. And there's no one more genuine that I know than Harlan Ellison. Yeah, I'm going to ask Mark. I'm sorry. You couldn't find one of my enemies. <laughs> they, they found me, but we took care of it. I'm going to ask Mark to come back to the podium for just a minute because you gave me a couple uh, tidbits of news about the, the documentary just before. Harlan does not know this. Um, I spoke to Eric Nelson uh, this afternoon, and Eric, I think, is more, his heart is in the same cardiac unit with Ron at this point. I mean, he just, he wants to know, how's it going? Is there an audience tonight? Are they, there, are they here? How's it going? Eric, calm down. Uh, well, Eric has some news. Um, this film has been picked up for a New York premiere, April 2008, at the Film Forum, which is a very prestigious opening grand event. Had <laughs> a schmucks New York, we beat him to it here in Cleveland. Uh, then, in the summer of 2008, will be the DVD release. The extras ought to be wonderful for that. <laughs> and then it's going to be shown on the Sundance Channel in 2009. So, Eric's been busy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, you're very fortunate, folks. This is the, uh, as I understand it, this is really only the third time the film's ever been shown to the public. Uh, and it's the first time ever outside of Los Angeles, and we are seeing, for the first time ever, a newly edited version, which I don't know that Harlan's even seen the most recent version. So. 
Yes, you did. <laughs> now, a couple, of, a couple of things. We are going to uh, you know, have, hear from Harlan immediately after the film, and then we'll, we'll do some book signing and that sort of thing. But I do want you to pay attention to the placards out in the lobby, and there's also Harlan's mailbox out there. So if anyone has a personal uh, message for Harlan, please uh, write it down, and then we'll make sure he gets it. And uh, I don't think there's anything else to do but set up the play. Uh, play it, Sam. Ready to go. Now, how many pages? 655 single space pages of nothing but my work. I get exhausted just looking at it. <laughs> and next to him is Andrea. Now, you saw the cheerleader thing going on in there? That's their daughter. Her daughter from the first marriage, which was a shitty marriage. We're not going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> and his first marriage, which was even worse. He was married to this very, very beautiful woman who had the personality of the snake lady with the seven, you know, with the big snake in the head. And finally he managed to get rid of her. And what Andrea's going, oh God, is he really going to tell this guy? And he's one night he's gigging. Where were you gigging at the time? Uh, New Bedford, Mass. And he's playing with the group. And he suddenly looks in the audience. He says, that woman looks familiar to me. Am I getting my telling right so far? Close. Close. He comes down and he says, aren't you such and such? Didn't we go to high school together? He had been in love with her in high school. She had gone off and married a putz. He had gone off and married a, a lady of not nice behavior. And uh, it's the little C word. I never use I don't like that word. There's a lot of words I don't like. That's one of them. Uh, and uh, I don't mind saying it's accurate. Your, your kid is asleep. This is child abuse. How can you bring a How can you bring a child to my lecture? <laughs> the father did this? Oh yeah, we'll get Doc, Dr. Phil is waiting for you. <laughs> 
You took your children to hear Carl and Helen. <laughs> He's a sweet thing. You want If I get you a pillow, would you look? You could cack out right here. You could do. What's his name? James? Jimmy? Jimbo? <laughs> the Jim Meister? <laughs> El, El Chimos? I'm not going to get through it. He's just not going to give. He is a really tough nut to crack. Ah, I got a smile. I got a smile. Not bad. Anyhow, moving right along, uh, he says to her, um, want to go have a drink? She says, yeah, let's go have a drink. They got married. <laughs> Terrific marriage. Alexa is their daughter. So Alexa, so Alexa, I said to her, Alexa, I said, I'm doing this script, and I'm going to put you in it. And, you know, people say, crap, like, oh, yes, I'll put you in the movie. I'll put you in the movie. And I put, up the, I put her in this scene, which I wrote for Josh and me, we're supposed to be Josh and me, because together we look like the 1939 Trilon and Paris Bureau for the World's <laughs> Fair. I mean, he's, he's about six foot, what are you, six five, honey? Six five, he's big, big, as big as Barney. And I'm a little round, fat guy. So it was going to be our scene, but uh, uh, Josh couldn't do it, and I wound up doing it. And uh, um, the costume designer did not put Put down the A on the spirit for her name, Alexa. Instead, this woman had this flowing schmatter, which is a Yiddish word meaning. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta plant the audience. So uh, we go to we go to Vancouver to shoot the damn thing, and I walk into the. Uh, if you think a chef or an army. You know, for a sergeant is bad. An art director on a show, please. You don't say squat. And I walk in, and they're taking me back to show me my costume. And I see the sketches, the artist sketches. They're hanging up. And the one of them is this thing, and it says, uh, uh, we call it Sis Boomba. Everybody on the ship calls it Sis. And it says, for Sis Boomba, you can show it. So uh, it's a Sis Boomba. And I look at it, and it looks like something Isadora Duncan would have worn, you know, the vase. <laughs> and I said, what is this? And she said, well, that's the costume to New York. New York set design. This is the design for the cheerleader. And I said, uh, the gag works if it's a cheerleader. If it ain't a cheerleader, the gag don't work. Do you get it? And she says, well, I had this vision <laughs> of expanding the horizons of the ethical structure of the universe and encompassing within one diaphanous garment the basic Apollonian Dionysian conflict <laughs> and the obstacle. And I said, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> I said, it's a cheerleader. Short skirt, bobby socks, cheerleader. Now, the producer, who is a multimillionaire and put on, among other things, The Sopranos, Becker, his name is Keith Addison, he's big time, and he's standing there, and I'm the writer. The writer means nothing, but he thinks I fell out of the sky. Keith Addison thinks I'm Hodgkin. And I'm not about to disabuse him. <laughs> Let him think I walk on water. But I lose it, and I say to this woman, you don't think? There's a reason the writer put it in the script. It's in the script specifically. And I'm spitting food. <laughs> and, I, and now look, around her are all of these little Korean girls that she has brought in from, I don't know, some basalt mine in, 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 in the middle of Indonesia. And she's got them sewing till they go blind for a dollar a year. <laughs> and they hate this one. They just hate her. And I, I learned later, everybody else hated her on the set. She was just a terrible person. Yeah, she was, right, they're supposed to say Alexa High. Instead, they put a C, which, hallelujah for me, was Cabral. Cabral was. So I said, we couldn't find an name, so they put a C. Fortunately, her friends believed her. 
so they had this screening at Rehoboth and Alexa. Anyhow, so uh, the woman starts to cry. And I know that game. <laughs> I know that game. And I said to her, Do I have to hurt you, Anderson? <laughs> and the coming down in tone is like Tony Soprano saying, You better let us pick up the garbage. You understand what I'm saying to you? And she went down to the garbage place. And you, you saw, I'm sorry, most of you missed the show. It was a really good show. Uh, it's going to be up for a number of awards and uh, like that. So, now that you've seen the, oh, and I have things to tell you. I have things to tell you. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, you must wash your hands. Gentlemen, ladies, the latest statistic is that one third of all the men who go to the bathroom and take a piss do not wash their hands. <laughs> now, last night at the Academy Tavern, uh, I was in the bathroom powdering my nose, as I said to the kids at John Carroll earlier. Now, how many of you were at John Carroll earlier today? Well, yeah, but you're not a student. Are you, you, were you a student there? Yeah. It went stupid. The one, I swear to you, after it was over, the, the, uh, the, the instructor, Steve Hayward, who was their professor, uh, we were talking about the effect that I had on the, the kids. And uh, he said it was like watching a cobra at a mongoose rally. <laughs> <laughs> These, it was... Nothing makes me angrier than college students who are so damn dense that they cannot even summon up the self, the gravitas, to ask you a question. And you're standing in front of 60 of them and you say, I'm a famous person from a far land. I just fell off the dark side of the moon. Ask me anything. I know the answer to everything but three. There's only three things in the universe I don't know. Let me save you the trouble. I know one of you thinks you're going to get smart. What are those three things? <laughs> that is called a tautology. If I don't know them, how can I answer that question? So, moving right along, um, I think I scared the crap out of them. They were, they were, and I didn't even have to say anything very offensive. I made a few remarks about Jesus. I did, and I said that Jesus, I thought Jesus, I would be real pals. That Jesus obviously walked among the crowds, which is what I was doing with the students. And every time I would come near one of them, they would. I mean, anybody who invites me to speak is out of their, their mind. Nonetheless, they invite me to speak at Notre Dame. Now, can you picture a less appropriate venue for me? <laughs> The Vatican, you know. <laughs> so Susan and I come in with our with our bags at the hotel, which is an on campus hotel. Thank you for coming. Look, the time is running out on the babysitter, right? <laughs> Party garage is closing. Party heart, yes. Party on do. Party on do. <laughs> I play that game too. So uh, we get in there, and it's this, this wonderful hotel where they put up uh, the, the, the parents of, of students who come to the college and VIPs and visiting professors and blah, 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 blah. It's a very nice, small hotel. And the woman at the desk immediately goes, Why are you trying to take this? <laughs> of all the dipshit, silly looks. <laughs> Man, if I is Britney Spears what you aspire to? We have a woman with billions of dollars in an empty panty drawer. Okay, I won't attack you anymore. You don't care? You enjoy being attacked. Good, I'll see if I can find a sadist. Sadist the masochist, you're about to have sex with. Masika says, hurt me. The status says, no. <laughs> Susan and I go to uh, the room. We, walk, we open the door, and it's twin beds. 
that dog you want to hunt. <laughs> so I say, okay, let's go down. We'll get another room. He obviously didn't know we sleep in one bed. And as I turn, I look at the wall, and on the wall is hanging a large dead shoe. <laughs> <laughs> so we go downstairs, and I say to the lady, nice lady, would you give us a room with one bed? Oh, certainly, Mr. Husband. Sorry, I, I see it here now. We, I said, and, 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 uh, and, and, and then as I start to turn back the other way, I said, oh, and one other thing. Would you, would you give us, uh, uh, would you please have the crucifix in the room taken down? And take it away. And she wasn't upset or offended. She was just curious. She said, I, why? And I said, I, I, I have my reasons. And I started to walk on the elevator and suddenly stopped and turned around and said, and could you turn all the mirrors? <laughs> <laughs> Selling my body in Euclid Avenue. <laughs> it's not been working out well for me. <laughs> so, um, the book I want to show you, the one I want to push for a moment. Is that my piano drum? Oh, man. I know I'm going to have to with you. Saturday is, uh, I read from, from this this afternoon, and I read some of it, and I promise you, if you buy this book, not only will you only love it, but it will clear up your psoriasis. <laughs> <laughs> if you take the book and you place it on the body of a crippled person, <laughs> if the person walks like this, they will crawl. <laughs> Oh! <laughs> <laughs> 
Artie grabs him and drags him out of the room. I got some very funny friends. So I was telling you about, you were talking about the Mideast, you thought I forgot, the Mideast crisis. Huh? Let me answer that quick. What's Bud Fuck? <laughs> Bud Fuck is people who still believe George Bush has been posed to be a president. <laughs> Anybody who believes it? No, 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 no. Bud Fuck is, I'll tell you what's Bud Fuck. It just got me a lot of trouble. I, I was on the radio this morning. How many of you heard the wonderful radio? Oh, yeah, okay. And I got, yeah. Um, on the view the other day, oh, God. do not ask me what I was doing watching the view. Please leave me a little something. I'm watching the view for about three minutes, and I came in after the setup of what was happening, but they got a new woman on the show who's replacing, I guess, Rosie. And um, they had, I guess, been talking about religion and belief in God and blah, blah, blah. So I come in as Barbara Walters is saying to this new woman, well, it's good to have faith and good to have religion and you want to believe in God, that's fine. I said, but doesn't some of what you're saying fly in the face of evolution? And the woman says, I don't believe in evolution. Now Whoopi Goldberg is sitting there. Whoopi is one of the smartest people I know. And Whoopi says, say what? <laughs> <laughs> and the woman says again, I don't know, I don't believe in so Whoopi says to her, do you think the earth is flat? That if you sail a boat, it will go over the end? The woman says, may I be struck dead if I'm lying or exaggerating? The woman says, I don't know if it's flat or not. Whoopi says, you don't know whether the earth is flat or round? <laughs> Inherent in this question is we've seen pictures of it from space. What the hell do you think? is a, a clever simulation and the woman says i don't know what it's flat or right. i don't think about i don't think about what i think about is i will feed my children which is such bullshit she's on fucking television she's got more money than creases feed my children i got to feed my children. Right. anyhow <laughs> i i hate different things and she says how am i gonna work how am i gonna go now everybody around her looks as if they have been Ow! Slammed with a hammer in the middle of their forehead like a real small pony. And they don't know what to do with this woman. And she is now saying she doesn't know whether the earth is flat or round, which I thought was subtle about 637 BC. <laughs> well, I talk about this on the air. Uh, what was the um Dee Perry? It was a very bright woman, a very elegant lady, very nice. And she's asking me, you know, what's wrong with America in general? I said, where do I start? <laughs> you know, I mean, let's talk about the, the, the ignorant constituency. I said, okay, you may not know who Thomas Hardy is. You may not know who Ina Slaughter, the ball player, was. You may not know where Cambodia is located on a map. But who the hell doesn't know that the Earth is round? <laughs> and, and I said, here's a woman on television expressing a view, a view, that is just plain stupid, stupid, there's no other word, stupid, it's that, my dear, it is butt fuck. <laughs> So I get a call from the USIA. <laughs> I told you I'm old. I ain't seen now. Uh, listen, I understand perfectly. I wish I could go home and go to bed. But the each person here paid fifty dollars to get it. Did you pay the? <laughs> Is, uh, is a drilling team, the U.S. Army Dental Drilling Team. We'll be here drilling. Uh, 
I love it when an audience gets me. <laughs> my mother still to me, an audience gets me, I don't have to restrain myself. You're all too mild. You've been living in Cleveland too long. <laughs> Your spirits are broken. Uh, so the USIA says, you'll come, you'll speak if you want to see them. I love this carpet. It looks like spawning paramecium. <laughs> Is Holly still here? Did she book? Talk, would you talk to her about this carpet? You could get you could get a real thundering headache this way, this carpet. Are you looking at the carpet? Are you people looking at the carpet? Dusting. Dusting. Oh, God caught up with me at last. <laughs> Since, since you didn't want to finish that uh, little story about Lenny Bruce, could you maybe explain why you censored yourself and didn't finish the story? <laughs> I thought it was better than talking about the carpet. The question. <laughs> But I'm sad, disappointed, your master. <laughs> you welcome for your hands to being filled. But actually, I wanted to talk about the fucking carpet. <laughs> answer her question. I didn't finish what story about Lenny? Yes, you never. I, I know I didn't finish the story about Lenny. Let me finish this. Then I'm gonna give me a clock. <laughs> give me a clock. Ow, you let me just get it. I'll finish the story. You'll come to the hotel room. My wife and I will entertain you. <laughs> the story was when he had a tattoo. He goes to his grandmother to wash up, and he's talking about taking out the rope soap, which was the white soap with the blue soap with the blue muggins of it on it, star baby on it, washing up at the sink, and his grandmother sees a tattoo. Jews have to go into the ground the same way they came into the world. You can't have any, you got a, a metal split in your leg. You can't be buried in, a, in a, uh, an Orthodox cemetery. You have to be buried, I don't know, in Potter's Field with the Goya. I don't know. You know, maybe it's people who failed Michael Jackson tryouts for the, the thriller video, but I, I don't know. But anyhow, uh, she sees the tattoo and she begins to, hi! I doctor, I my doctor. He says she began screeching like a Yiddish seagull, <laughs> and, and, and she said, "You can't be married. You can't be married in an Orthodox cemetery." Oh, Lenny says, "So you cut the arm, you'll spare it in the Jewish cemetery. The rest of you in the Jewish cemetery." <laughs> Was it? Now, you won't hesitate to rectify any other errors or slips that I made. I, mean, I, I am an old man, and sometimes my mind turns to, I don't know, puree of that shit in my head. <laughs> Meanwhile, the U.S. I... <laughs> Get him when he gets up. <laughs> the U.S. IAs has come to Israel. Now, my family, with the exception of Lisa and Lauren, who I'm very fond of. I cannot think of a more excruciating place to go than a nation filled with people like my relatives. <laughs> I want to see Israel about as much as I want a red-hot rivet driven into my left eye. <laughs> Egypt, yeah, I'd love to see it. <clears throat> Petra, you know, a city, Egypt, you know, the, 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 what, what, how does it go? A Roseburg City half as old as time. I'd love to see those. But I probably wouldn't get out alive. So, but I don't really want to go to Israel. It's all oh, expensive. Paid, you'll be seated, you'll be a great American writer, a Jewish American writer, la di da, la di da. I say, okay, all right, I'll go. Everything is terrific. They set it all up, the tickets are in our bags. Susan Van, if I'm going to have to get Susan, usually it's my brain on these things. Maybe a month before we're supposed to go, we're called for an interview by the Jerusalem Post. Jerusalem Post is the equivalent of uh, Dumont in Paris uh, or, or uh, uh, the New York Times in America. It is one of the 
fake newspapers of record in the Middle East. And a guy calls me and he says, I, I mean, I'm approximating this to make it a little funnier than it actually was. I said, Hello, this is Abraham bin Lachman. Hey, <laughs> Asher bin Hukma begat Sukma, and Sukma begat Jugula. <laughs> Saffron and Saffron do Litex, and Litex got Velcro, and anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> so, they, all, they all had these weird, these weird things. And uh, he says, uh, We want to interview your great writer. You're coming to Israel. We want to talk to you. We want to interview you. And uh, may I interview you? And I said, uh, I'm very honored. I'm a class guy. U.S. government said to me, I'm a class guy. The first question he asked is, what do you think of this situation in the Middle East? Now, what he wants me to say as an American Jew is, <laughs> spit on those fucking towel heads. Those rotten camel jockeys, they should all die, every one of them. Nothing but terrorists and monsters and blah, blah, blah. blah. This was long before 9-11. Well, I don't feel that way. So I said to him, why would, why would you ask me this? I said, I'm a professional liar. I make up fantasy stories. Why do you why do you ask me this if I know something? I have no idea. He said, No, we're very interested in your opinion. We want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> Sounds like Jackie Nation. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie Mason says, but he said, Jackie Mason says, hey, he says, I was such an ugly baby. My mother used to knife on my face. <laughs> I think that's a so funny one. It made me laugh. You're a tough room. I got it. <laughs> you really are a tough room. It's like talking to a Jackson Pollock painting. <laughs> so uh, the guy really pressed me and he kept after me and he wouldn't stop. Well, one of my guiding lights in philosophy is the old, very old Chinese proverb. There are no new. Young Chinese proverbs. It's like old Greek philosophers. There are no young, new Greek philosophers. And he says, uh, So I said, Okay, be careful what you ask for, you might get it. And I said, You really want to know what I think? He says, Absolutely. I said, Okay, here's what I think. You're all Semites of one kind or another, whether you're Libyan or Saudis or Israelis or Egyptians. You all come out of the same melting pot, the same piece of colloid material that made Lucy, made you. You are all one of a kind, and you have been fighting over there for, the last time I checked, about 4,000 years. I said, you all want the grail. And I said, my attitude is this. I think we ought to put up a wall 100 miles high around the entire Middle East, around Egypt, around Libya, around Saudi Arabia, around Israel, around all of it, 100 miles high with one door like that. One door, a regular normal door. Once every five years, we will come and open the door. If you're still fighting, we say, hey, have a good life, close the door, let us know what you're doing. <laughs> if you're at peace and you're happy, then we'll open up and let you come back and join the human race. Now, there is a deathly silence on the other end. <laughs> there is a silence one encounters only at the bottom of America Deep, the Cayman Trench. We are talking a silence of the grave. And he says, thank you very much. It hangs up on me. Within an hour, Washington calls and says, the trip has been canceled. <laughs> Have I answered your question? <laughs> It's going to take a while to get there, but I, I answer the question. All right, it is now 10 of 10. We have machine gunners at the door. You see, you see the security gentleman standing back there. He's, he's got the taser, and, uh, and, 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 and we'll use it. Uh, if you'll come down past Susan, you'll buy a book. I'll be sitting right here. I'll be standing at the lectern. I will happily chat with you. I'll tell you an anecdote. Sign your book. Please send this boy to camp. <laughs> I cannot thank you enough. You've been just swell. Thank you. Thank you.